the University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. It's a great pleasure to introduce my longtime friend, Larry Smarr. Larry has had a uh, checkered career. It began as a cosmologist, uh, and uh, he spent a number of years really doing groundbreaking work in cosmology, and then one day through his telescope, he saw the light and turned to computing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, was instrumental in launching the National Science Foundation Supercomputer Centers program in the early 1980s and led NCSA, uh, the University of Illinois' National Center for Supercomputer Applications, which was by far the most innovative of the supercomputer centers. Uh, then Larry saw the light again in about 2000. This time it was through a fiber optic cable. Uh, and he discovered that uh, networking was where it was going to be at and moved to UCSD in 2000 to head uh, Cal IT2, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology. This is one of four hundred million dollar centers that uh, uh, that the state of California bootstrapped through a competitive process back then. It's joint between UCSD and a set of other uh, a set of other campuses. Uh, just a really remarkable thing. In the past few years, actually going back almost to the time he moved to California, Larry's become a, a huge advocate and self-experimenter in the quantified self-field. So the way I always ask this question is, why is your automobile so much better instrumented than your body? Right? Um, and uh, Larry is, uh, uh, is a living example of what you can do if you're, uh, uh, if you're getting continuous readouts of your systems. Uh, Larry has gotten a, a huge number of awards over the years. And uh, the most interesting one was just a week or so ago, maybe two weeks ago, he received something called the Golden Goose Award, which Sounds like an odd name. How many people here remember the Golden Fleece Award? <laughs> Those who are my age. So the Golden Fleece Award was a terrible award given by a, uh, a, a, a senator named uh, William Proxmire. And it was to federal research projects that had names that made Proxmire's, Proxmire's staff think they were wasting money. Right? So the Golden Goose Award is a, an award given to a small number of people annually whose research has just paid off in unimaginable ways. And uh, a, a, a key piece of, uh, for which Larry was uh, uh, recognized is that when he was running NCSA under his leadership, Mark Andreessen did the Mosaic web browser, right? So obviously that really graphical browsers caused the explosion of the web and the use of the internet. So it's uh, great that that was recognized. Larry, welcome to UW. Thank you, Ed. So Ed and I um, have been colleagues for almost 30 years and have made a lot of trouble working together. Um, uh, wrote a lot of, uh, been part of a lot of major reports and, and everything else, so it's always a great pleasure to spend time with Ed. Um, you know, this is a field that I never expected to be in and I'm still not quite sure how I took the wrong turn and ended up here, but here I am. So what I'm going to talk to you about is both the development of an entire new approach to living things, in particular us, um, that's probably going to have major ramifications for transforming medicine. Certainly medicine will be completely transformed. Healthcare may be. Uh, and, uh, and then while I'm at it, I'm going to have to actually teach you some biology uh, that I had to learn myself because I never had any. Uh, formal training in biology and medicine. But because of the digital environment we have, you have all the scientific papers online, and so you can go and educate yourself. And so I, I um, engaged in some late age uh, self-improvement of learning about a lot of different fields. Now, when I started Cal IT2 with this we, we worked with 24 different departments at UC San Diego, UC Irvine. Um, we had some transformational themes that we thought, what we were looking at is how the continued exponentials of information technology coupled with biology and nanotechnology, we're gonna transform things. In particular, we're gonna transform medicine. So we had this idea, and this is a slide from my 2001 talk, so you know, almost 15 years ago, that um, uh, the first thing and it was a little odd, we were gonna put your body online. Now, remember this is uh, two years before the introduction of cellular internet in the United States. So there not only weren't internet phones, there, weren't, and there wasn't a wireless internet, right? But we knew there would be, and in fact, we were doing early experiments with it. 
And we felt like that uh, with the development of the miniaturization of sensors, that you were going to be able to pretty much read out in real time um, your body as the whole automobile industry had been transformed in the previous several decades um, from knowing when you had a problem because smoke came out from under the hood and you burned up your engine to having more computers in the 90s being sold into the automobile industry than into personal computers. And, and so as a result, you have five subnetworks in cars, you have probably 100 sensors, actuators, flash memories, processors, and they keep, they just measure for no good reason. That's the important thing. You don't measure the spark plug firing because you think there's a problem with the spark plugs. You just measure it and get the data. And then when you go in preventively every 20,000 miles, they not only read out your data from the flash memories, but they compare it across national networks to all the other cars of your make and model. And if you're in the middle of the bell curve on each variable, that's fine. If you're not, there's an algorithm, take this module out, put this module in, rotate the tires, whatever, and you're good to go. And 200,000 miles later, your car is just as good as it was the day you bought it. But we don't do that for our bodies. We don't measure anything to first order about our bodies. And so the question was, what's that about? Um, furthermore, we knew that even though we just spent $4 billion to get one human genome for the first time in history, uh, by the time that we are here, we predicted that it would be like $1,000. And then after that, even less. So they would become a standard medical test. So basically, all of you would have your full human genomes known. And that would give you sort of your t equals zero uh, informational starting state. And then as it goes, as you interact with the environment, including what you eat, drink, everything else, how much you exercise, you gradually would be able to read out the time development of the system. So it basically goes back to Newton and being a physicist. That makes sense. You know, the state of a system is time rate of change. You can figure out its future development. Not so much in biology, but we're going to get there. So now why did I personally decide to start doing this? <clears throat> well, here I am uh, about two years after the first National Academy of Sciences report that Ed and I were on a member of. And I was about the same body as I had when I was a uh, teenager. Um, here I am at the end of a terrible thing that happens to humans. It's called the 40s. <laughs> and for those of the students among you, I know you can't imagine that this could happen. It must have been some terrible disease. But the fact that in the last three or four decades, we've gone to two thirds of Americans overweight or obese uh, a huge, huge increase in the fraction of our population during which time our genetics didn't change, okay, indicates that there's um, also an environmental impact uh, from the pseudo food world that we are surrounded by. Um, but once I got to La Jolla, I looked around and saw that I didn't look like any of them, <laughs> and that I, I, I just had this terrible nightmare that they were going to send me back to the Midwest if I didn't <laughs> get with the Southern California program. And, um, and so I did. But the main thing is that I was able to do it by actually learning how your body works in subsystems, your glucose insulin system for, uh, that, among other things, is insulin is a gatekeeper to your fat cells, the uh, inflammation, anti-inflammation, and omega-3, omega-6 ratios and all this. So by actually taking a sort of a physicist approach or an engineer's approach to what your body is and therefore what you ought to put into it so that the subsystems work well, and you, know, you know, like people get pissed off at $4 a, a gallon gasoline, right? But there's not an American alive who would say, okay, I'm just going to fill the tank up with half water. There's not one of them. And yet they do not apply the same logic to what they put in their mouth moment to moment with the results as you can see. So by learning about nutrition, exercise, why those are important, sleep and stress, these are the sort of four pillars I call them of, of, of wellness, uh, and then applying that to myself, that's how this transformation occurred. Well in doing so, I was gathering more and more data. I never at all could have imagined when I started this 15 years ago and I was stepping on a scale every day to 
you know, get one unit that would basically be an integrative measure of myself, my weight, that um, even just a few years later, I would be taking 150 variables, blood in my blood, biomarkers, um, that I would then be an early adopter, 23 in me, and I'd get a million single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, on my uh, DNA. That's where 90% of all human variation occurs on the uh, full uh, 6 billion based DNA. Or that now I would be working on the micro uh, biome, uh, which I'll t define and talk about, but it's all the microbes that live inside of you, and that that is really in the billions to tens of billions of numbers, which, by the way, change every time you eat something. So, so that's what I do I, I, in tracking myself. Now, this was all good, in the, and I just assumed that that's what I was doing, was improving my, my body. But what happened is I got more and more data is an amazing thing that I didn't expect to happen, that I discovered I actually had a chronic incurable disease, an autoimmune disease, that I had no idea I had. And I debugged that by essentially, I discovered it by basically data analysis. Well, I just sort of figured once I got into this that that was my doom. I just had to be like this single crazy person out in the wilderness forever. But my goal was to convince real credentialed people like Lee Hood, who I've worked with for 25 years, to say, wow, this is the future, and so let's make a very large-scale experiment. And so I spent the last day and a half over with Lee because I'm one of the, uh, uh, one of the hundred uh, healthy pioneers, and in fact, there's at least one, two others in the audience. Um, and this will grow to 1,000, 10,000, then 100,000 people uh, if all things go well. And what they're doing is exactly the same thing. They're doing the self-tracking devices, the Fitbits, the uh, keeping track of your food, um, my fitness pal and all that, your medical history, your traits, your lifestyle, blood, urine, saliva, gut microbiome, whole genome sequencing. In fact, Ed just told me he got, uh, and I'm, I can't wait to get to my computer after this talk, because our whole human genome results have just come back, literally a few hours ago. Um, and so, uh, and then this is periodic, so we're doing it every three months, uh, and, and then looking at this vast amount of data and doing data analytics over that. Um, now, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to generate this data? Well, one of the things that helps being an astrophysicist is you know that there's 8,760 hours in a year, and, and you might, if you're really lucky, get one of those with your doctor. So all the rest of them are with you alone. And if you don't know your own state, good luck with that. It's like driving. If you didn't have, there's a reason there's a windshield that's transparent in front of you and there's a speedometer, you know? Uh, and, 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 you know, I know we don't think about it that way, but they should. Anyway, so being at Cal IT2, this is our 64 million pixel wall each of these is a high definition display, two million pixels. This are, these are 150 variables, and each of these lines you see is a particular biomarker in my blood or stool over five to 10 years. Uh, and I sample it about every month to three months uh, on average. These days it's pretty much every month. Um, and then that's me. That's my time state and my time development, at least as far as the biomarkers are concerned. And the amazing thing is when I looked at these, particularly in the blood, there was only one of these that was significantly out of normal range. And so this is called complex reactive protein. It's something that all of you should have your doctors normally measuring, but they don't for odd reasons, probably because there's not an insurance code for it. But what it does is it gives you the overall measure of inflammation in your body and Americans in particular are highly inflamed because of the pseudo food that they consume, um, which is very high in inflammatory omega-6 uh, fatty acids compared to omega-3 anti-inflammatory ones, but that's another story. Anyway, the point is this should be less than one, right, to be healthy. And it was five, and then it was 10, 15, and at this point, 
Um, I would go into the doctors with these graphs, you know, because I'm only getting the data. But when I went to the doctors like here, I said, look, something terrible is happening inside of me. We have to do something about that. And they said, oh, well, how do you feel? I said, what the hell does that matter? They said, well, 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 why are you here? And I said, because I've got data. And they said, but that's not useful. I'm a doctor. <laughs> At this point, I, I was out giving a talk like this, and I got the most, the most painful attack in my life right here, which they then later said, oh, must have been diverticulitis or something like that. And I, it was the fact that it was right at the spike of this curve, you know, was highly coincidental. So, but then they gave me like 10 days of antibiotics and they said, CRP went back down, you're fine. And I said, not so fine. If your CRP is five on a chronic basis, it quadruples your future chance of heart disease because that inflammation drives plaque formation in your arteries. But they said, well, get out of here. I've got sick people to deal with. So um, <laughs> I kept tracking this, and, and, and you know, before long, it's up to 27, which is like crazy. Um, well, at that time, I began to realize that um, I could also uh, take measurements from stool. And you might think, why would you do that since your doctor is, how many of you have ever had your doctor get data from stool? Okay, very few. Well, it turns out that, of course, your colon is your largest immune organ. And so it has all kinds of immune variable readouts that your blood isn't gonna necessarily have. This is one of them called lactoferrin. It comes from, uh, it's a, it's a a protein that's shed from the surface of neutrophils. Now, your, your neutrophils are your most numerous white blood cells, and when they're in attack mode, there's some sites called the killer white blood cells, they send out these antimicrobial agents to knock out the bacteria, uh, and, and this is supposed to be less than seven. And up there is 900, okay? And, and, and so, you know, uh, I had, had a doctor who was giving me colonoscopy, and I said, you know, I, I, I think I actually may have an autoimmune disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, which about a million or so Americans have, and um, because this is the sensitive and specific uh, measure uh, that you have that, and he said, well, I just gave you a colonoscopy, and I can tell you you don't have it, and I said, really? <laughs> and he says, yeah, I've been doing this for 30 years. And I said, well, I guess you've been doing so many colonoscopies, you haven't had time to read the scientific literature, but here's six peer-reviewed papers that say if you've got a number like that, uh, you must have it. <laughs> so I fired that doctor. Um, <laughs> because what this is, is this particular, and I didn't know anything, what's lactoferrin, right? Well, but we live in an age of Google, so you can go find out, and then you can get scientific papers on it. And it turns out, it, it is a, uh, it sequesters iron away from bacteria, and there are certain classes of bacteria that require iron, and so that's why it's an antimicrobial. So I said, huh. So first of all, this thing is oscillating. Well, as an astrophysicist that started cutting his teeth on, you know, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic accretion on the black holes and calculating that on supercomputers, when you see something like that, it tells you you have a coupled system, all right? Probably a nonlinear coupled system, and I said, well, what's the thing coupled to? Well, it's doing this to get the microbes, so presumably it's coupled somehow to microbes. Didn't know much about the microbes at that time. So then I got a new doctor who turned out to be one of the top researchers in the United States, and you don't really care about my medical history at all, but it sort of ties together why I did all this. Uh, you could do this for anything, any disease, any, any health for that matter. But he said, look, the way we'll figure out if you've got IBD, you either got ulcerative colitis, which provides a sort of a inflammation to the surface of the internal surface of the colon, or you have Crohn's disease, in which case it, you, know, the, you actually get penetration of the wall and the walls get thicker and so forth. So let's do an MRI. So in fact, an MRI with contrast. So I get in the tube. I've done uh, you know, a lot of these. Um, <laughs> and when I get out of the tube, the first thing I said is, give me the data. And the reason is, is because, of course, I've got a whole team of virtual reality uh, folks. And so instead of looking at these black and white single planes, you just take the same data, put it in the virtual reality, and you get a full 3D fly-through 
um, and, and then we put it in our cave, and then I give, I've given you know, 100 tours of my body uh, to visitors. Uh, but the point is that bits are bits, and so what bits are there for is to have software eat them and do things. And, and so what you see is this particular odd thing that goes on here where the descending colon comes down in the yellow, and then there's this funny kink, and then, and then there's that sort of blue and yellow, and then that goes, that's the aorta coming down and splitting into the two iliac arteries that go down your leg. But because it's digital, I can then just pull out the colon, the disease part. So I knew from colonoscopy there, there was some inflammation in this part right here of the sigmoid colon, where the descending comes around this way before it turns around and goes back through to the back and then out. Um, and you hear all this stuff about 3D printers. Well, what it turned out, we'd had 3D printers for five years, and I said, well, I really want to get to know this thing that's causing me trouble, so would you make me a three-dimensional uh, printout? And so here's my high-resolution uh, printout of, from the MRI data. It sits about here. And, and, and this is the inflamed part, and you can see the diverticula sticking out. Now, I find out that most GI doctors have never done this. Which is sort of strange. I mean, back here, the mesenteric arteries, you can see they're inflamed because they're, they're, the inflammation is actually getting out through the wall and into the cavity, and so these things should be capillaries, and they're bigger. So, Ed, here, you want to hold my... <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's, it's a, a thing I learned about being in California, it's sharing. Um, <laughs> So, but the thing is, the important, the serious thing is you can then do digital cross-sections. And what you can see here is the width of this wall. That's supposed to be three millimeters, like sort of the thickness of a balloon, like a water balloon. <laughs> and instead, it's 15 millimeters. And so that indicated that at least in that section, there was not just this inflammation, but the walls. And that was the neutrophils going through the walls, which is why they were shedding lactoferrin and so forth. So it all began to make a certain amount of sense. Um, and by the way, this 3D printing is going to be, here you can pass around, Ed. somebody else might want to hold my colon. Um, <laughs> but um, the reason I'm doing that is because this 3D printing thing is going to be huge. Already there's lots of places that are building the, uh, printing the matrix and then putting the living cells on the matrix and actually creating things like artificial, um, you know, not full yet, but artificial kidneys, things like this. And I think this is going to go very rapidly. Uh, but again, it's this combination of things that are information technology and physical things. So um, I had no idea why I could have had, had this thing. Well, I'm, I'm not going to have enough time to take you through the human genome piece, but I went through, looked at my um, SNPs from 23andMe, and indeed I had a single nucleotide polymorph polymorphism. That's a point along the, you know, a site along your six billion bases where you have instead of, you know, like a C or a G instead of an A or a T. So it's like, think of it this way, it's just a single, if you had a software program and you went in and you changed a comma to a period or something, right? It wouldn't work as well as it did before. And so we all have these, 90% of all variation in humans is in just this one million places along the DNA that that you can read that out. So I knew I had a um, host genetics problem. We've seen that we had an uh, immune system disruption. You got all this stuff way out of normal. And then they said there's this microbial factor. So now this is a 2007 paper by David Relman at Stanford, who's one of the top people. Um, and I said, I can do this. I bet you I can quantify all of these. So I'd, I'd been able to quantify the immune system. I do it through the SNPs, I was able to do the histogenics. So I set out, how do I do the microbes? This is the only reason that what I'm telling you is possible. And this is this incredible, faster than Moore's law, uh, decrease in the cost of sequencing that has happened. And Illumina, which is in our hometown, in La Jolla, uh, is the world leader in this right now. So, in other words, I would have had to spend 10,000 times or 100,000 times the money to do what I'm telling you just a few years ago. Um, okay, so why is this going to change so much? And it's, some of you may know this, but some of you may have missed the memo. It turns out that you're only 10% human. 
90% of the cells in your body are bacteria from hundreds, if not thousands, of species. And more importantly, 99% of the genes on the DNA, the things that make protein on the DNA, are in the microbial DNA, not the human DNA. And none of this is in medicine today, not in terms of understanding the disease, not in terms of therapy, not in terms of anything else. And the reason is because you couldn't, before genome sequencing, know who was there. If you look under a microscope, these things are roughly you know, a rod, a sphere, or a helix, or something like that, and yet there's thousands of species, so you can't do it that way. You have stains that you can use for some of this stuff. But by and large, until genome sequencing, you could not actually differentiate um, all these bugs, but now you can. I'm going to start talking about some things, and, and so for those of you who are biologists, I'm sorry to dumb it down like this, but for those of you who haven't um, thought about biodiversity and the genetic level, we're going to talk about things that are called phylums, and phylums are the largest units of taxonomy for living creatures. So to, so to get, get us sort of warmed up, think about we're vertebrates, right? And, 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 but so are goldfish and frogs and, you know, birds of prey and gorillas and blue whales and snakes. We're all, that's a lot of biological diversity, but we're all vertebrate, and that's a subphylum of chordata, things with the spinal cord. So all of that biodiversity that we're used to when we go to zoos, you know, turns out to be just one phylum. But we're going to have at least six phylums to worry about in the microbe world. So let's add, let's keep the chordata, but now let's add all insects. And that's uh, over here, right there. And then uh, all the mollusks and all the earthworms, segmented worms, and the radially symmetric critters like starfish and sea urchins, and the jellyfish and all the corals, and each of those is a phylum. So that gives you right there six at the macro level that you actually know about, but you might not have abstracted it like that. And what we're going to talk about is mainly six of these in the microbial world. Now, Carl Woese, who was a physicist and who was a mentor of mine at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign back in the day, <clears throat> was the person who realized that by using genetic sequencing, at that time what's called 16S ribosomal RNA, which we don't need to get into, but anyway, it's a way that, it's, that you can tell differences in one specific gene on DNA of all living things. And then by looking at the distance, you know, mathematically you compare them, you can tell, you can build this tree of life. And what he found was that there was actually this tree, the, there was this portion archaea that were not known before, um, as well as uh, all of the um, multi-celled animals and the bacteria. Now, interestingly enough, all that last slide I showed you with the six different phyla is in that little twig called animals, which you'll notice is very near slime molds. <laughs> and so the genetic difference between you and a slime mold, for all that we love how great we are as human beings, is real small compared to the genetic distance across the bacteria that we're going to talk about. So there's methanogens, for instance, I was 20% methanogens, which is basically the world's record as far as I know for a human. Um, there are gram positives, there's proteobacteria, bacteriotes, we're going to talk about those. So, so this is a really hard thing for people to get used to, is that the biological diversity, the genetic diversity, it, that's what's sitting, you know, of these hundred trillion microbes, almost all of them in your gut, your large intestine, and they have in there more biodiversity than the best zoo and the best aquarium all put together, right? And by the way, we hadn't thought about that, right? Even, I get these GI doctors who, even today, who, who will say, yeah, this microbiome thing, I don't know what that's about, it's just a passing fad. And it's at the heart of why their whole thing they work on day and night functions. This is from a paper of just a month ago. It's the first time that a scientist has sequenced their stool every day for a year to really find out what in a healthy person is the natural variability of the different phyla, which you can see here, bacteriotes, vermicutes, either Firmicutes or Firmicutes, depending on how you like it, actinobacteria, and so on. 
And what you can see is, is it's pretty homeostasis. It's pretty, you know, sort of like oscillations around a mean, except for when he flew to Thailand <laughs> and that green thing, which is proteobacteria, E. coli, all of a sudden developed within a day, 24 or 48 hours of his getting to Thailand. And when he got back to the U.S., it went away. And so this is the environmental impact, whether it was the food or was the you know, other bacteria that were there. But it, what's amazing to me is this is not like looking at details of disease X, right? This is one healthy person, and it's the only one we have. Actually, it was another one, which is a postdoc, um, that also did this. So we're very early in this whole business. And the way I was able to do this is I had been working with Craig Venter uh, on um, building for the Moore Foundation um, the, a global uh, supercomputer, basically, for all environmental microbial samples. And we ended up with something like 6,000 microbial, environmental microbial scientist users from 90 countries around the world all uploading their data. Uh, and that's where we developed a lot of the software that, that we'll be using. And that was joint between the, the Craig Venter Institute and, and my institute. So I knew Karen Nelson, and I, um, starting, this was really just two and a half years ago, she had been one of the pioneers of the Human Microbiome Program. And I met her, and in the first, like, five minutes, I said, I don't suppose I could send you some stool. <laughs> it's sort of an icebreaker, you know. To, conversation-wise. But the point is, I needed to get to Illumina's to get the, the depth of sequencing I wanted to be done, and she agreed to do a collaboration. But then to figure out, so then I did actually seven samples over a year and a half. We did, um, uh, basically, what an Illumina does is it, imagine you've got hundreds of species, actually you've got 10, 100 trillion of these bugs, right, each with DNA. And there are a billion of these microbes per gram of stool, right? So you sort of imagine breaking up the DNA into lots of little pieces, throwing it through the Illumina, and out comes units about 100 bases long that say, we know for this 100 bases exactly the order of the ATCs and Gs. And that's one unit. Well, you do that, in my case, 200 million times. And you, so just imagine you sort of, it's like from a, you know, think of it as a jigsaw puzzle with 200 million pieces. And now you've got to get a computer algorithm and software and everything else to put back together what must have been the mi microbes that were there and what their DNA was and what the relative abundance of each of the species. But then once you know that, how are you going to know whether you're, what it means, right? So fortunately, for, for the last seven years or so, the NIH had funded the Human Microbiome Program, and we were able to download 250 individuals each at a point in time and take their raw data and run it through our same pipeline that we were doing mine with. And we were fortunate that there were some uh, samples of people that had um, uh, ulcerative colitis or ileal Crohn's. And when I say ileal Crohn's, so right here is the ileal cecal valve, and that goes in the small intestine, joins the large intestine, and this last part of the small intestine is called the ileum. But it's very different, and that's why there's a valve <laughs> to keep the two, sort of like a lock, you know, in a Great Lakes. It's because there's several orders of magnitude, fewer bugs per cubic centimeter, basically, in your small intestine than your large intestine. The most debilitating form of Crohn's, particularly for young people, it could, the average age of diagnosis is about 20, is in the ileal part, whereas mine is in the colon. colon. Um, so those are different manifestations. Then we downloaded from NIH uh, all known genomes for bacteria, archaea, virus, fungi, about 11,000 of them. Um, that's about 30 gigabytes, just to beginning to get the idea of the data size. Um, so now we've got um, basically 100 million times all of these people is about 27 billion reads, each 100 long, so about 2.3 trillion bases. And that's what we needed to now align with the, uh, the 27 billion reads with um, these. And so imagine taking the 100 bases you know, you bring it up, and you go across 11,000 genomes until you get an exact match, and now you've got one of those bugs. And if, you, if, it's a, if it's a, 
you know, a housekeeping gene that is in multiple microbes, and you do a one over n, and, 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 and that's how you get the statistics. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go through the software pipeline that we use that uh, Waizong Lee, who was a research scientist working for me, has now been hired by uh, the Venner Institute and, and the Human Longevity Inc., uh, the new startup of Craig's. But the main thing is you start up here with the raw reads. You've got to filter out any human DNA that might have been sloughing off cells, you know, from your colon and stuff. QA everything, quality sure everything, and then finally you can do this uh, checking against reference genomes and get the taxonomic profile, and then eventually you can get over here and call all the genes and actually get down to the functional aspects. And I'll mainly talk about the taxonomy a little bit otherwise. Well, fortunately, Mike Norman um, and I have worked together for 40 years, and he's the director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center. I said, Mike, I have a big data problem. He says, Larry, I have just been awarded by the NSF a big data supercomputer called Gordon. And um, it is an architecture that's designed for big data. It was, of course, why do you call it Gordon? Well, of course, it was called Flash Gordon. And the reason is because it had, you know, you get, how many have a 64 gigabyte flash drive or flash stick? How many have a 128? How many have a 256? Okay. Well, this has 256,000 gigabytes of flash and Gordon. So, um, so I got a grant of time on that and did 20, uh, Wyzong and his and our team did 25 CPU uh, decades to uh, compute this. Um, so don't try this at home. But um, <laughs> then Dell got excited about it and they have an HPC cloud and we've been wanting to see whether you could do this with the right kind of high performance computing cloud. And we got access to theirs, and so they gave us another 35,000 core hours. What happens when you're done with this? What's the answer? Well, 300 columns, each a person, um, and then you've got 10,000 bacteria. So it's about 3 million filled, spells, filled cell spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet. And that's what I start with now. Fortunately, we had some people who are more intelligent than me, so we now have it in a full relational database and so on. But the main thing is you can then pull that out and you can say, okay, let's look at, say, the top 200 species in their relative abundance organized by their phyla. And you can look at, for instance, healthy people with Crohn's, people with ulcerative colitis, and me at, say, three different times, which is what you see here. And what that allows you to do is see very large-scale patterns, but at the same time you can go up and read the name of every single microbe, and you cannot do that on your laptop at this scale. So it's why we use the scalable visualization. So then um, let me give you an example of what that lets you do. So each of these bars is a species. We've organized them and colored them by their phyla. So the most numerous, so in you, two phyla, dominate at the sort of 90 plus percent level, the bacteriotes and the Firmicutes, red and blue, if you don't like that. And then there's proteobacteria, which is in purple and um, a few others. Okay, so that's what a healthy person looks like. But notice this is a log scale on the left side. So at the top is a one that's 100% of all the bugs. Next down is a tenth. And so that's, you'll notice that the top one is a little more than a tenth, say 12% of all the bugs is that species, the one on the extreme left. Uh, and then the next one down is a little bit less. And there's about a dozen that are more than 1%. But then they go down this power law. And so basically, you have all these rarer and rarer species. But they're there. But they mainly are suppressed, as you would think, because this is an ecology. So imagine a forest. As long as a forest is there, all of the stuff that's down on the floor gets shaded out and suppressed. But if there's a forest fire, all of a sudden, you get this bloom of all this stuff, and that's exactly what happens in your colon because you are in ecology. Well, I said, oh, that's great. Let's look at 155 people at once. And we have the pixels to do that. So that's 155 people's profile. And you'll notice they all look about the same. Namely, they're blue and red. And they're pretty much you know, healthy. So what we're getting at now is how you do surveillance across a population. But as we looked at it, we noticed that there was one individual, and this is supposedly in a set of healthy, 
people that the NIH had, had selected. And when we zoomed that up, amazingly enough, remember it's on a log scale, the proteobacteria had taken over at about 95%, 98% of all the species. And to remind you what you were comparing it to, and so what you can see is that the, there's like a dozen species of proteobacteria that are bigger than the highest red one. <laughs> so you have had a massive change in the microbiome's ecology, and this person cannot possibly be a healthy person. Well, just, what, Ed, a month or two ago, we got, for the first time, of the 100 healthy pioneers, the volunteers to be in part of Lee Hood's program, here is um, the readout. Each of those bars is a, is a person, and it's a stacked bar graph. And you can see, again, and even though the colors are different now, the bacteriotes, which are this color down, this pink color, and the Firmicutes, which is this sort of ugly orange, uh, yellow color, uh, have that same distribution that we saw uh, earlier, that, that basically your 90, if you, these are stacked bar graphs. So at the top, in other words, that's what's left over. But you'll notice, oddly enough, that there are a few outliers that have the purple, uh, you know, in other words, that's 100% at the top. So like this guy over here has like, I don't know, 40% or something purple. Uh, and then over there, there's a few others. And the blue ones are the proteobacteria, which are E. coli. Now, I have the honor of being the one inside of the black here. And so you can see I've got a lot of proteobacteria. That was about 25%. In, in most of you, if it's healthy people, it would be a few hundredths of a percent. And I was 10% uh, during a lot of my time. Uh, and that's because of the disease state that ends up doing that way. But then there was this, I, I hate to lose at anything. You know, I'm a very competitive person. And here's somebody over here in, the, in that middle red thing that had more proteobacteria than I did. And I hate particularly losing to Ed. <laughs> I'm like walking E. coli. <laughs> now, we don't know what that means about Ed. Uh, but because we also have all these biomarkers, we're now doing correlations between the, the, the uh, ecology and the biomarkers. You know, we've got 40 or 50 years of ecological dynamics that we can borrow from and bring into medicine. And so here's from an article by David Relman at Stanford, who's beginning to, to take the results that we've learned that no, basically hardly any practicing doctor has any clue exists because it's in this different field, and bringing it in because we have to learn about it if we're going to understand how humans work, because we are in ecology at a very high level. And so one of the things you find is you have different equilibrium states, like a coral reef, but then when it gets really polluted and everything else, it degenerates into algae, and there's no, all the corals dead, and all the pretty fish go away, and there's little bottom feeders. That's a different equilibrium. And, and so what happens when you look in the, in, in, in the data, up here, again, here is your, your phyla that we talked about, the blue and the red being the bacteriotis and the firmicutes, and as you see, 90% is the healthy at the top. But in ulcerative colitis, you can see that that has been replaced, half of it almost, by proteobacteria. And over here, you can see that the blue, that teeny little sliver next to the red, is what all that blue was. So you have not, they call this in the, in the literature, they call it dysbiosis. It's a mass extinction event. I mean, when the, when the asteroid hit at the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago, and it wiped out the dinosaurs. What percentage of the families of reptiles do you think were destroyed? Only 20%. Here, this is a 50 to 1 reduction in the dominant phyla in, in your microbiome. And that's a typical Elio Crohn's person. So, um, The thing you can then begin to do is take more advanced statistical analysis. So this is simple principal component analysis, but it's at least a start at clustering. And the blue and the green are healthy and ulcerative colitis. But what this shows is by looking at the species level, you can break out these black ones, which were Crohn's, and the red ones, which were Crohn's. 
But oddly enough, the kind I have, colonic Crohn's in the large intestine, completely separates statistically in terms of the distribution of the ecology. That was not expected. And this is Janet Jansen, who's now moved from a Lawrence Berkeley lab to uh, Pacific Northwest uh, National Lab, and who ought to really be a great collaborator for you. Um, so we tried to reproduce that, and sure enough, when we do the PCA on our 300 people, we see exactly the same thing. We see the um, ileal Crohn's separated from the colonic Crohn's. Now, those are not considered separate diseases, by and large. But clearly, the underlying microbial ecology is radically different. That means what you should do for therapy is going to be very different. And though this is why it's beginning to inform, uh, inform uh, gastrointestinal research. But the real payoff is in the cell pathways and how, you know, how these little optimized chemical factories are changing what they're doing. And, and there's a thing called keg, keg which is the Kyoto, da 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 da. Anyway, it's a, it's a database of about 10,000 different pathways that uh, I have. So now I have a spreadsheet with 10,000 pathways times you know, uh, 300 people and so on. Okay, well, there's a new startup that came out of Stanford's math department called Ayasti. I don't know, have you, any of you heard of this? I hadn't. But, but anyway, these are brilliant mathematicians, statisticians, and so forth from Stanford that have been funded by Venture to produce this capability. So I gave them my data. And they started working with me, their chief data scientist. And what you can see here is by looking at the cell pathway database, not the species and phyla, not the taxonomic database, but the actual real uh, cellular pathways, you begin to see these differences. So blue is very low and red is very high. And you can see in the healthy, if you, if you compare uh, the, the, like the light greens up there in the healthy people, but down here, they're much brighter colors. That means these are much larger values in certain subsets of the cellular network. And look here how this is very light blue and up there is very yellow. So what this is is an interactive topological uh, data analysis tool with about a couple hundred algorithms that you can choose behind it. And, and so we're now using this because no one knows at the moment what actually is wrong with you. What's wrong with you is that you have this massive change in your ecology. That leads to a massive change in the cellular pathways and the biochemistry that's going on. That engages the immune system, which then goes crazy and attacks you. And we're very close to being able to figure this out for the first time. And this will happen across you know, many other disease states. Lee Hood talked about, and this is from a paper of his almost 10 years ago, in which he was looking at the the cellular networks tied together. Each of those dots is one of my 10,000 um, kegs. And at, in, in mice, at two weeks and 12 weeks and 20 weeks, you begin to see this propagating uh, uh, perturbative cell network. And so graph theory and all kinds of things like that that many of your experts on is going to be a, an essential part of what we do. Now, I've only got this done on a subset of the healthy, about 65, and I want to do it on all 255. In the estimates, that's another one or two million CPU hours. But I think I'll probably be able to get that. Plus, we're setting up a dedicated 10 gigabit link between uh, our institute and, and where this is, which is in Urbana-Champaign in Illinois. And the final thing I'll just say, and I won't get any detail in it, is I talked to several of you today about where using simulations of the underlying system helps to really understand the structure of the data. Well, we don't really have first principles, um, you know, laws of physics type of things uh, for much of biology, but that's changing very rapidly. And this was a, a, a major uh, event in, uh, in uh, 2012 in cell, where for the first time, all the processes that are uh, in one living cell, this uh, one of uh, Venter's favorite, mycoplasma genitalium, uh, all of the different things that the genes code for they actually have in a computational model, and they're able to actually take it through a mitosis and successfully and measure the output of the simulation against the measured um, in the lab cell. And the same thing is going for systems biology and modeling the actual dynamics of the gut microbiome. It's very early days, uh, but the same is for the immune system. And then you want the coupled immune system, human immune system, with the microbiome. And I think in the, really the next five to 10 years, this will be a pretty advanced level. And so you'll have a simulation capability for the human going down to the individual cells 
that we've never imagined was going to be there. So I'm helping set up a uh, similar trial to what Lee Hood has, but for IBD uh, for that particular disease age. IBD is just one of 80 autoimmune diseases that the NIH recognizes. Um, and so we're going to be basically turning all these people into me, that is, genetically measuring them uh, in terms of uh, time series. This kind of large-scale thing is being ha done at Harvard with the Personal Genome Project. That's George Church, who is a longtime colleague of, um, of mine and Lee Hood's. Uh, and DELSA, uh, Gene Kolker, I don't know if Gene is here or not, but it is, is, uh, this is a national data-enabled life sciences research initiative. And they're basically taking my data set and Mike Snyder, who's the head of genomics at Stanford, who's been even, is, is like two orders of magnitude more quantified than I am, because he does the full proteomics, uh, uh, the metabolomics, the transcriptomics, and he's doing it for uh, almost 50 months every month. And so those databases are being made available openly. Uh, all of my medical records and all everything else have been put up in the public genome project, and uh, my home, human genome, my full human genome is there, all my microbiome, all, my, my, all the biomarkers. Because if we don't get this stuff out there for researchers can get at it, um, how are we going to make any progress? And so there's issues of privacy and laws and all that stuff, but somebody's got to take the first step. And so really, you know, that's what I've been doing. So I'll just end there. and. Uh, that notice that this takes an a incredibly cross-disciplinary team. Um, people are experts in, in bioinformatics, all the people that wrote the visualization software, analysis software, the people that did the sequencing at the Vitter Institute, the supercomputer team, and then these are all uh, MDs that uh, we work with in the, in the School of Medicine. So that was just a trip through one person and one disease state, but I think it gives you a sense of where this is going and how quickly it's, it's going. So I'll stop there.